Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. Situated next to Cusco in the Inca heartland of Peru, Sacsayhuaman is one of the most incredible ancient structures in the world. It's truly mind-boggling how such enormous blocks of stone can be so randomly shaped yet so perfectly put together. I've deliberated over it many times because it really felt like a genuine mystery. These are large blocks of limestone, sometimes huge, most of which seem to pillow or bulge out instead of having straight sharp cut faces. Some blocks seem to curve round corners, others have scoop marks on their faces, and a number of them have the famous nubs. There are many other seemingly bizarre and unnatural features. Each block is irregular, and each one is unique, yet the joints between these limestone blocks are perfect. So how is it even possible? Aside from the debate about just how old the so-called fortress is, there are also many theories regarding how it was built. Some speculate there was a type of stone softening agent added that allowed the limestone to be moulded. Others believe that each block is actually man-made from some kind of geopolymer mixture, whether cast in moulds or just worked into giant lumps of a dough-like substance. Others speculate that these are actually cut rocks, but that some kind of high technology instrument was used to make and shape them. The quarries for these grey limestone blocks are believed to have been located. It is pretty much accepted by all. So, this does imply the blocks were cut from the natural setting and brought to the fortress. And, as some of the blocks weigh more than 150 tonnes, this feat would be truly incredible. The official view is that each block was cut and shaped by hand using basic tools, until the fit was almost perfect. Then the blocks were rubbed together, back and forth, back and forth, until a perfect joint was formed. But is what we are looking at simply hard labour? Because there are perfect three-dimensional joints on most of the blocks, and on every contact surface. It would have taken a huge amount of time and effort. Now, I have a master's degree in geology, I've seen limestone in the field, and I've seen many objects made from different types of limestone. And well, granted this doesn't sound too scientific, but something about Sacsayhuaman just feels a bit off. Sometimes the rock just doesn't look real, like some kind of hardened grey play-doh. The blocks don't look like they've been cut from a quarry and stacked. Something about each block just looks artificial. Why do they bulge out on the main face of the wall, like the weight from above has pushed the stones out? This block seems to bend around a corner, and although of course you can cut a block of stone to this and any shape, is it a mere coincidence that the cracks are located on the bend just here? It's just all very strange, and these walls all seem somewhat unnatural. For me personally, just my own thoughts and no disrespect to anyone who disagrees, but I am very sceptical of high technology cutting tools for ancient construction projects. Because if such tools did exist, how did they manage to evade the archaeological record on every continent of the world? From old excavations by antiquarians to the more modern systematic approach. I just think that by now we would have found something. But saying that, and for Sacsayhuaman in particular, I'm also not sold on the idea that these are natural rocks. Cut from a quarry, worked by hand, and stacked accordingly. I've speculated in the past that maybe some kind of stone softening agent was applied, possibly some kind of acid, and this would allow us to manipulate the surface of the limestone. Limestone does dissolve in certain types of acid, but although this may be able to explain the perfect joints, I'm not sure it can explain the bulging appearance of the faces of the blocks. At the end of the day we can stare at pictures and speculate forever. What we need to be is scientific. I've always said that samples need to be taken, and the geology needs to be analysed, and that will tell us everything we need to know about Sacsayhuaman. Well, little did I know that such work had already been done, and I tweeted all about it quite recently. The findings were quite incredible, almost too incredible, and maybe that's why they are not widely known. 
I found out that geophysical and geological analysis had seemingly been done through official channels and an official report was made. Yet, it seems that nobody is talking about it. The work does feature on a few websites from 8 or 9 years ago. There are a few videos on YouTube, but the work has not permeated to a larger audience. And I really don't know why. Detailed petrographic work has taken place on the blocks of Sacsayhuaman. There are at least 9 samples already analysed from across the site, as well as a comparative study to samples taken from the associated quarry, the proposed origin of the stones. To me, the findings were quite shocking, because it changed everything I thought I knew about this incredible ancient wonder. But last week I deleted my tweets on the subject, because some people were questioning the authenticity of the study, of the science and the report. The final report wasn't in the form of a peer-reviewed paper, but then again it was never planned to be. The purpose of the work was to find out why Saxe Horman was deteriorating so badly. People were asking me, if this is legitimate information, why isn't it so widely known? And that's a good point. Why are the findings of an official report not widely known by everyone with an interest in ancient civilizations? For some background, in the past few decades, the Sacsayhuaman archaeological complex has witnessed a number of destructive natural processes. The stones were deteriorating. Large cracks were opening up in the main walls. We see the shifting of stone blocks in the recession of walls. This could well have led to irreversible change to the site. And so, nine years ago, under the guidance of the Ministry of Culture of Peru, geophysical and geological analysis was undertaken by a team of Peruvian, Russian and Ukrainian scientists, employed by the Ministry of Culture to get to the bottom of the cause of the damage. There was a clear objective, and a clear set of tests were given the green light. On this picture, the sections of the wall that contain fractures are highlighted in orange. The red parts are where the wall is already destroyed. You can see here the wooden frames that were added to keep the wall stable, which is really quite a worrying sight. It was found that the movement of water beneath the walls was destabilising the foundations of the fortress. The soils were fissuring, processes that were going on at quite some depth. The megalithic walls were therefore subsiding naturally. The site can be saved by working on a new drainage system, and I would assume that this work has now taken place as the report was published nine years ago. But on top of this, experts had also long noted extensive erosion on the surfaces of a great number of Sacsayhuaman blocks, and so rock samples were also taken to find out exactly what's going on. It's one thing to stop the walls from collapsing, but another to stop the individual blocks eroding. So, a variety of samples were taken for geological testing, including a microscopic look at the geological microstructures, the characteristics of the rocks, the chemical composition and so on. The first and most basic test was to find out the rock type which was assumed to be limestone, something we all say today, and seemingly confirmed by the fact that a sample completely dissolved in vinegar. Because of the composition of the blocks, researchers concluded that even small amounts of acid in rainwater would damage them, and, over time, it could well destroy them beyond repair. Therefore, it was recommended that the blocks of Sacsayhuaman were to be covered with a protective coating, which again may have already taken place, I don't know. So, that's the background on why geological work has taken place in recent years, and it is well documented. But because the work was called into question, I had to understand the setup of the project and the organisations involved, and it really wasn't that easy. Furthermore, all of the documentation, websites, reports and so on are either written in Russian or Spanish. And so I'm having to rely on Google Translate, even when emailing various people involved in the work. Here is what I know and what I've fact-checked as best I can. 
the company Geo and Asociados SRL, and several geophysicists from the VNI ISMI Institute of Russia, headed by Dr. Andrei Veryanov, carried out a study on the subsoil of the Sacsayhuaman Archaeological Complex. With GPR scanning technology and a surface study of the blocks, on behalf of the Ministry of Culture in Peru. This is shown in pictures on the Geo and Asociados SRL website, which is now rebranded, I should add, to Geo GPR Latino America, and you can learn more about them at GPRteam.com.pe. The geological and geophysical work at Sacsayhuaman was done at the beginning of July 2012, which has also been confirmed to me by email. So, naturally, when I found this out, I wanted to see their results. I wanted to find their official report, but it seems it was nowhere to be found online. But that shouldn't be too surprising. Because, as stated, I'm not looking for a peer-reviewed paper, it's a report that was made for the Peruvian authorities, so they can understand the cause of the damage to the walls, and also the damage to the individual blocks. Well, whether it was leaked online, or whether it was published by consent, the report is available but it's not easy to find. Before I go further, I'll be doing a follow-up video on the geophysical survey results because there are a number of features not everyone knows about, such as the depth that some blocks go down to, and some strange features below ground that are still unexplored today. There will also be a part 3 on how all of this geological work may help us to date the site. In this video though, I want to discuss the petrographic findings, the analysis of the rocks themselves. With background research and with confirmation by email from various parties involved, I have no reason to doubt the authenticity of any of the claims in the report, and the content did feature on a number of independent blogs and news sites in 2013, as well as on the website peru.com. A more detailed follow-up paper was published the following year by the ACEDA project, which you may have heard of. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's first take a look at the findings published in the official report to the Ministry of Culture in Peru. The paper is written in Spanish, but I uploaded the PDF to Google Translate and I was able to read the important piece of work. The first six sections look at the geophysical methods, testing and results at Sacsayhuaman, which I'll discuss in a separate video. But the final section, section 7, looks at the surface analysis of the rocks. The purpose of this work, which was spectral, physical and chemical analysis, was to investigate the level of erosion on the blocks. As well as geologists in the field, a number of Russian laboratories were involved in the analysis, again, all credible companies, including the Institute of Tectonics and Geophysics. Samples were taken from carefully selected places across the site and were looked at in thin section under a microscope. The limestone from the quarry is an organic limestone and it is made from marine microorganisms, a natural rock where you can clearly see many fossils, just like with many types of limestone. There is no doubt that this is a natural rock. But the sample published in the study from Sacsayhuaman is different, in that it is made from 1 to 10 micron calcite crystals, which was confirmed by phase X-ray analysis. There are also veins and lenses that are filled with thicker zones of crystalline calcite. There may be a few traces of fossils, but these have all been recrystallized. But the official report states that traces of natural fossils, microorganisms and microstructures of the limestone are gone. So, in hand specimen, the two rock types do look very similar, but they are very different under a microscope, yet the samples have a near identical composition. Because of this, scientists concluded that the blocks of Sacsayhuaman have to have been made from limestone from the quarry, because the chemical composition is too similar to be a coincidence. But if that's the case, the stone from the quarry has been processed. It's changed from a sedimentary rock to a fine crystalline rock. The scientists said in their official report that it's impossible to be a process of nature. That's the opinion of a team of international experts. As they state, in nature organic limestone can be metamorphosed or recrystallized into marble. 
But marble, even the fine grain variety, has a larger crystal size than what we see at Saxe Horman. Here the crystals are minute, and the structures in the block are uniform. It's a homogeneous rock without fossils or stratigraphy. The scientists go on to discuss how an acidic environment, like the acid content in rainwater, will dissolve the blocks of Saxe Horman little by little over the years, and they recommended a protective coating be applied to the blocks. So this was the first and main revelation. The blocks of Saxe Horman are not taken straight from the nearby quarry, yet they do have the exact same composition as the limestone in the quarry. They are also apparently not just heated or metamorphosed by nature, because the grain size is too small to be a naturally formed marble. As stated, the experts concluded it was impossible to be a process of nature. I thought that was the end of it, but the next revelations come in the conclusion of the report, with their expert opinion on how the blocks of Saxe Horman could have been made. They believe that material was collected from the quarry, was pulverised and ground, and used to make a mixture to create blocks. In terms of geophysics, the large basal blocks on the first level of Saxe Horman were also scanned, and it was discovered they were low density and covered with an artificial shell, the shell being made from the same substance as the smaller blocks that sit above. These large blocks are therefore not one compact rock, but are in fact agglomerates. So, in summary, they said there were two types of blocks in the Saxe Horman archaeological complex. Type A are the low density large blocks of the first level. These are made of a number of rocks, but with the shell of the crystalline substance that covers them. The experts believe that these blocks were made in this way so they could receive as much weight as possible. They were scanned with geo radar, and the interior is not homogeneous like the other blocks of Saxe Horman. The smaller yet still big blocks above are type B, and these are made entirely from the fine grained microcrystalline substance, the same substance that forms the shell of the larger type A blocks. The report is nearly 30 pages long and really focuses on the problems regarding the stability of the structure and recommendations on what should be done to protect it. It is technical, thorough and it is good science. It is a legitimate piece of work that was done by reputable people working directly for Peruvian authorities. For me, this was all pretty mind-blowing stuff. And thankfully, since then, more work was done to try and make sense of the findings. The following year, in 2013, another paper was released, this time by the Aceda Project. If you don't know about the Aceda Project, they're an ancient history research society, a group of independent researchers as well as qualified scientists who are looking to answer the many questions concerning the mysteries of our ancient past. They have been to places like Egypt many times, have published countless important photographs and associated information on their website, and have also released research papers through the website academia.edu. The Aceda Project paper was written by Alexi Kruser and is titled The Question of the Material Origin of the Walls of the Saxe Horman Fortress. I've linked it below in the description. On finding the paper, I sent an email to the Aceda project, again to authenticate the claims made. And I got a response from the authors of the paper, who explained to me that Nikolai V. Berdnikov, PhD, was the man responsible for the geological work. He works for the Institute of Tectonics and Geophysics, part of the Russian Academy of Sciences. He was part of the original project team. Before I get to the content of the Aceda project paper, I want to point you to a YouTube video, thankfully dubbed into English. It's called Plasticine Stones of Saxe Horman, and I believe it features Berdnikov explaining his findings to various other geological experts in Peru. This happened either late in 2012 or early 2013, just after the official report was presented to the Ministry of Culture in Peru. It's 17 minutes long, and explains the origins and background of the project. It's a good video, and I've linked it below in the description. For now though, I'll pick out some key points. At 3 minutes 51 and 3 minutes 55, he shows the quarry rock samples in thin section, and we can see the fossil shells and the limestone matrix. 
Around the four minute mark, he shows four samples taken from the stones of Saxe Horman. He says, Fine microcrystalline limestone, almost not even limestone, but more like marble. However, marble in most cases is macrocrystalline with large crystals. But here we have very fine, fine, finely crystalline limestone material. In some cases, there is this vein running through it with larger material. At 4 minutes 42, he shows a picture of normal masonry blocks, but running through them is a trough or channel. He explains that this is unnatural. He classifies the rock that makes the fortress as being a very, very, very fine microcrystalline calcite. And again, after showing the compositions, it is clear that the rock of the quarry and the saxe Horman blocks are the same material, but somehow we see totally different types of rock. As he states in his conference, his opinion and interpretation of the geology was that the ancient Peruvians quarried the limestone and ground it to a fine powder, and then roasted it to get quick lime. Then, after mixing it with water, they poured their blocks. He explains that the next mystery is how these blocks have survived for at least 1,000 years, as conventional lime-based mortar doesn't last this long. So, he says there were either some technologies that made them extremely durable, or maybe some kind of additive. One way to find out is to do a finer and more detailed chemical analysis. He also explains he is unsure how they physically made the large megaliths and then constructed them. But that's fine because he's a geologist, trying to make sense of some very unexpected and unusual scientific results. It still all needs explaining. Berdnikov then shows this, which he says is the plasticine stone made from the same mixture, sitting directly on the natural andesite below. This implies the Peruvians were directly working on the andesite surface when they were processing and moulding their blocks. One man stands up in response and says it's just natural limestone laid out in a conventional way and dismisses everything that's been said to him which does seem strange in a room full of geologists, and also based on the presentation just given. Tell me, what kind of pouring could be the result of what is seen in this area here? This is all natural limestone laid together using a conventional method. Another guy then stands up and explains he does agree with Berdnikov's conclusions, and believes that these blocks must have been made from a lime-based solution, and that the transition from the solution to the rock appears to be very rapid, as is seen by the tiny size of the crystals. He agrees there is likely some missing additive in the mixture. He says that maybe it's something to do with the conditions in Peru, low water saturation, or a certain temperature regime, which allowed for the rapid crystallization to take place. Berdnikov ends his talk by saying that yes, that's the direction the analysis needs to go in. He needs to continue conducting the chemical analysis and examine the physical and mechanical properties of these blocks. But he says, quite honestly, that good geologists from around the world must be sent to Peru, who should examine the site, take samples with permission, and microsections for analysis. And then maybe the dilemma can be resolved. This conference leads us nicely into the ACEDA project paper, which does take this work a stage further, although in a more speculative way, to try and offer a more scientific interpretation to the results. Alexei Kruser, the author of the paper, explains that, as the chemical analysis shows, the specific limestone that was used to make the blocks of saxe Horman is classified as a Marley limestone. Marley limestones are typically between 25 and 75% carbonate, with varying amounts of other materials like silica, often in the form of clays, silts, sands and other impurities. As this chart shows, the blocks of saxe Horman contain more than 13% silica. The source rock type could therefore be classified as a siliceous limestone. But, as we have seen, the blocks of saxe Horman are microcrystalline, and therefore they don't contain silica in the form of sand grains. When the scientists dissolved the samples of saxe Horman limestone, the silica that was left was amorphous in nature, which is expected due to the recrystallization of the rock. Marley limestone, also known as just marl, is a raw material used to make modern cement, but it is also used to make something known as hydraulic lime. 
to get hydraulic lime, Marley limestone has to be heated to 900 to 1100 degrees Celsius. A number of chemical reactions take place, but this is an interesting substance because according to Alexei Kruser, it has the ability to petrify in water as well as the open air. For some background, according to the website traditionalbuilding.com, hydraulic lime is made from a limestone that either naturally contains or has artificially introduced some form of amorphous silica in the burning process. This amorphous or free silica fuses with some of the quicklime to form a clinker, a cementitious compound. That cementitious clinker is what makes the lime hydraulic, meaning that it will set with the addition of a certain percentage of water. Hydraulic lime provides a fast initial set and higher compressive strength than air lime. And furthermore, hydraulic lime will set in more extreme conditions including underwater. Compared to conventional lime, hydraulic lime has greater ductility and toughness, and is often used in areas subject to moisture and water. The Marley limestone rocks from the quarry, those used to make saxe Hulman, have the perfect composition to produce hydraulic lime. Hydraulic lime concretes have been used since Roman times, long before the conventional date of saxe Hulman, either as mass foundation concretes or as a lightweight concrete using tufa or pumice as aggregates. This lime has a variety of applications, including floors and even vaults or domes. An example is a pantheon in Rome, which has survived for nearly 2,000 years. The concrete dome's diameter is equal to its height from the floor. It is constructed from six different lime mixes, which change the properties and lightness of the material. Lime manufacturing is a true material science. The specific composition of mixtures affects the characteristics of the final product. It seems that compositionally and geologically, the blocks of saxe Hulman appear to be made from a type of hydraulic lime but maybe with a specific ingredient or additive that has allowed it to survive for so long. Whether saxe Hulman was buried or open to the air, since its construction it would have been subject to acid rains or acid groundwater, and therefore its survival is completely down to its composition. During the construction process, the water-resistant properties of the hydraulic lime blocks would stop a wet block from sticking to ones already hardened below. The one above would basically mould into the one below, and therefore making the perfect three-dimensional joints we see. When the entire wall was hardened, each block would be separate and easily detached if the wall needed to be deconstructed. According to the scientists, the shiny, sometimes vitreous surface of the saxe Hulman blocks is all down to the percentage of silica in the mixture, which makes it look like it's been polished. The silica is also what makes these manufactured blocks ring like a bell, as shown in this video by Geotech. So, the science here does seem on point. It appears as though it is very possible that the blocks of saxe Hulman were made from hydraulic lime, which would have come from heating Peruvian limestone. At saxe Hulman, there are of course a lot of blocks, which means we are looking at industrial scale manufacturing of hydraulic lime. Remember, the temperatures required were between 900 and 1100 degrees Celsius. Therefore, for the saxe Hulman rocks to be made by human intervention from an artificial hydraulic lime paste, the ancient people would have had to quarry the limestone and then heat it manually and we know that bonfires can reach extremely high temperatures if skillfully made. Special ovens could have been made, with wood and coal being the fuel. We've seen how fires from warfare affected Iron Age hill forts across Europe, reaching extreme temperatures and actually melting hard igneous rocks like basalt, which then recrystallised to form fresh basalt. But the main problem we have for the blocks all being made from a man-made mixture is the incredible volume of this mixture that's needed. It would be a truly enormous industrial scale operation. Was there even enough coal or trees? How was the rock crushed? Where is the evidence of huge amounts of burning in the archaeological record? Why is it not seen in sediments? 
we should find enormous deposits of charcoal and ash. We lack the evidence for the production of man-made hydraulic lime and the scale of the operation does seem unbelievable. Wouldn't it just be easier to extract, cut and shape limestone from the quarry? We can all argue over how the megalithic walls of Sacsayhuaman were made, but we can't argue with the science. And when we compare the rock samples from the so-called source quarry and the samples of the blocks that make up the fortress, we see the complete disappearance or dissolution of organic remains and the apparent recrystallization of natural sedimentary limestone whilst maintaining the same composition as the natural limestone seen in the quarries nearby. But after releasing the official report to Peruvian authorities, to give him credit, Berdnikov did find a natural way the rocks could have been formed, and it's detailed in the Acida Project paper. Yes, the blocks of Sacsayhuaman could be quarried stone. The initial claim is not right. These blocks are not impossible in nature. You can get the recrystallization of limestone in a natural setting if it was subject to intense heat. So the limestone in the region would have had to have been exposed to some kind of lava extrusion. Coming through the natural bedrock limestone formation and then spilling out on top. This would have created the high temperatures needed. And what do we have right in the vicinity of Sacsayhuaman? The famous Rododero formation of Cusco, an ancient extrusive silica rich lava flow that once pushed through the limestone bedrock and then flowed out onto the surface as well. Anywhere below ground or on the surface where the limestone and lava came into contact, the limestone would have been cooked to very high temperatures. The Acida Project paper says the limestone would have been transformed into a type of lime. This lime would then react with rainwater, hot spring water, groundwater or water vapour, and the naturally formed lime would then recrystallize into a type of contact metamorphose limestone, a type of microcrystalline marble. A sample of limestone was taken in the field right next to the famous Rododero formation, but I can't tell if it's a block or bedrock but this was shown to be the same rock type that makes up the wall blocks of Sacsayhuaman. I should add that geologically speaking, the Rododero formation is millions of years old and not recent. No specific fieldwork has been done on this idea, but it is a credible way to form the rock type that makes up the blocks of Sacsayhuaman. For the people that built Sacsayhuaman, they would have come across the incredible looking natural lava flows of the Rododero formation, and it would have been surrounded by recrystallized hard glittering limestone. So, it's not really a surprise that the rocks associated with this natural wonder would have been selected to build Sacsayhuaman, with its hard, strong and dense natural properties. In my own honest opinion, I do believe the Sacsayhuaman blocks are completely natural, and I think it's even proven by the petrographic work by Berdnikov. As we can see, some thin sections show there are calcite veins running through the blocks of Sacsayhuaman. In the veins, the grain size is larger than the bulk of the rock, but in terms of geology, veins occur when hot fluids travel through zones of weakness like fissures and then cool over a period of time, and that's what forms the crystals. The longer the cooling time, the larger the crystals. Therefore, how can you have veins of calcite running through a man-made concrete that was seemingly made from pulverized stone? The fact is, you can't, and therefore, geologically speaking, the blocks really can't be man-made. But I think there is another even simpler way to explain the blocks of Sacsayhuaman naturally. And it would mean that the man that stood up in the conference to say that these blocks are just natural limestone is in fact correct. Because you can have a carbonate rich microcrystalline limestone rock that forms naturally and without the addition of heat and recrystallization. The specific rock is called micrite. Micrite is a crystalline limestone made from calcareous particles ranging in diameter up to 4 microns. It is a carbonate rock and it's dominated by fine grained calcite. The word micrite comes from microcrystalline calcite. And how do the Russian scientists describe the rock that makes up the blocks of Sacsayhuaman? Yes, he calls them microcrystalline calcite. 
It is in fact a sedimentary rock, but has crystals instead of grains simply because of how it's formed. It is not some kind of metamorphosed marble. It is a sedimentary rock. Originally, micrite was thought to be exclusively of chemical origin, precipitating directly out of supersaturated seawater. But others say it has a biochemical origin, the sediment coming from the breakdown of calcareous algae skeletons, which live abundantly in carbonate environments. When hardened, the rock looks grey, dense, uniform and fine-grained, just like we see on the blocks of Sacsayhuaman. As stated in the book Carbonate Sequence Stratigraphy, some samples of micritic limestone have been found to ring like a bell when hit with a hammer. This is due to how dense and hard the rock can be, which is compact due to the small crystal size. Micrite can also fill cavities between grains, rocks and boulders, like a natural cement, and therefore there is a natural explanation for the agglomerate nature of the large blocks of the basal layers of Sacsayhuaman. Micrite is also found in sites around the world with amorphous silica inside the structure, just like we see at this site. So, the man who stood up and dismissed the claims by Berdnikov may actually have a point. He could actually be right on the money. But how do we explain why the blocks of Sacsayhuaman have the same chemical composition as the blocks in the quarry? Surely this also needs explaining. Well, for a start, we only have one sample taken from the quarry. We are not working with a good data set. Furthermore, a limestone depositional environment does form a variety of different rocks. In the geological record you can see a clear sequence. For example, if you have a sloping oceanic shelf or basin edge, different carbonate rocks form on different positions on the shelf, and these rocks directly relate to the specific angle of the slope, and also the depth of the water. But, at the same time, the different rocks all pretty much have the same composition, as the same sediments form different types of limestone at different depths. The limestone in the quarry could therefore be from the same depositional environment as the rock used for the blocks of Sacsayhuaman. And so, if these are natural rocks, then these were not the quarry's work to extract stone to build the walls of Sacsayhuaman. So, where did the stone come from? Well, I think I do have the answer. I next went to the website of the Arcana Factor, part of the Ombio Films Company, an independent research organisation established in 2013, and those behind the amazingly popular YouTube video, The Living Stones of Sacsayhuaman. They have also made great documentaries on the Nazca Lines, the Baalbek Monoliths and so on. They filmed the Sacsayhuaman project, and on their website, they have high resolution images and information on 10 geological samples that were taken. One of the 10 samples comes from the quarry and is clearly a natural organic limestone. This is the natural rock, and you can see that it does have many features and structures in the matrix, and many fossil shells are clear to see. The other 9 samples come from Sacsayhuaman. Deputy Director Berdnikov PhD from ITAG, the Institute of Tectonics and Geophysics in Russia, noted that 8 of the 9 samples were the fine crystalline calcite stone, but one sample, sample number 4, is questionable. Sample 4 is actually a missing link. We can see outlines of shells and organic material, but set inside the same microcrystalline matrix as the other samples. The addition of fossils is intriguing, because it implies we're looking at a natural rock, whether having undergone some kind of contact metamorphism or not. It clearly has a different nature to the sample from the quarry, but that's because this block of stone would be from a different part of the wider depositional environment. Electronic microscopy and microanalysis was conducted on this sample at Rostov University, which revealed that the majority of this rock was fine grained calcite, as well as grains of quartz and feldspar. There were grains of iron oxides and also crystals of potassium chloride. The university deemed this surface to be natural. 
They next looked at an unprocessed surface of the rock sample and found that it was covered with impurities, dust and modern organic matter. Interestingly, particles of copper were also discovered. The copper may well have come from a tool, indicating that this sample 4 did indeed come from a conventional worked block. Thermal analysis also indicated it was likely natural. But what of the other 8 samples from Saxe Huaman? Do we learn anything else? Well, yes we do. Specimen 8 is taken from an outcrop of a natural rock formation. Yes, on top of the hill that is surrounded by the megalithic walls of Saxe Huaman, there are in fact natural outcrops of limestone. Specimen 8 was described as fine crystalline limestone, with no traces of organic residues, and there were signs of recrystallization in fissures. Sample 9 is also not from a Saxe Huaman wall block, but comes from a partially cut limestone block, or maybe a worked outcrop at Coca to the north. This is right next to the Rododero formation. This too is described the same as Sample 8, both being the same type of rock that makes up the blocks of the walls of Saxe Huaman. So, whether the Saxe Huaman blocks are natural sedimentary limestone rocks, or limestone altered by the heat of the extrusion, the geology certainly tells us that the blocks are natural, because there are natural outcrops of the exact same rock type in the vicinity of Saxe Huaman. Furthermore, the fact that some samples of the blocks contain mineralized veins is a clear sign that they are not man-made molded blocks from some kind of lime mixture. All the blocks were likely cut and quarried on site, maybe from the top of the hill, or maybe on the slopes, or the area surrounding the Rododero formation. Looking from above, we can see that this whole region has been worked by humans, so we don't know exactly how it looks before Saxe Huaman was built but all indications from the geological work says the blocks were cut in situ. They were not brought to the site. As far as I'm aware, no further work has been done in the past few years. All of the samples were taken during the 2012 repairs, and I believe that some have still not been processed and examined, maybe due to cost, and also the fact that the project was conducted to understand the processes that were damaging the site. The project was successful in finding the causes, as well as recommending the solutions. This wasn't a project by inquiring minds to try and discover the true nature of the blocks of Saxe Huaman. This simply happened by chance when scientists were looking into the erosion of the blocks, sending samples back to Russia to be analysed under a microscope. Originally, the scientists involved in the mineralogical work offered one interpretation of the findings, a man-made origin, but the natural interpretation in the follow-up paper, as well as my own interpretation that they could just be my critic limestone rocks, I think are certainly more likely. The man-made interpretation would require incredible amounts of quarrying, pulverising, grinding, burning, moulding, shaping and transportation and so on. So for me, the job is just too large to be possible. Then you also need a huge amount of wood and coal. You also require storage facilities, specialist equipment and tools, trained workers to make the blocks, and also handle the possibly dangerous lime-based chemicals and more. You could do all of that, or you could simply quarry natural rock from the construction site, craft it into boulders and then work to join them together. The latter option, although more mundane and still difficult, is easier, more efficient and far more likely. In fact, there is even irrefutable evidence that at least some of the blocks were worked with conventional tools. These blocks were taken from one of the damaged walls during the geophysical survey of the site, and, as you can see, they are covered in tool marks. And as we see with sample 4, copper is also present on the surface of the block, likely from ancient tools. I'm not saying there are not mysteries still to be solved at Saxe Huaman, as well as sites like Cusco and Alantitambo. For example, I have a script in the works for these unbelievable and mysterious rocks known as Huacas, natural limestone but with perfect cuts that were done by human hands. There are strange features to consider, such as this snake-like figure in a Saxe Huaman block, and also what looks to be a form of writing that was found at the site. 
In this video, I've just looked at the blocks of Saxe Hulman, and even though an experienced geologist gave an initial opinion that these could well be man-made, this no longer looks to be the case. I believe the geology of Saxe Hulman actually proves that these blocks are natural, were quarried and cut, and now that I've looked at everything in detail, I see no hard compelling evidence that these are artificial geopolymer concrete blocks. I think everything can be explained, from how they ring like a bell when hit, the origins of the large agglomerate blocks, the fine crystalline blocks and so on. Since finishing this video, I've been told by a lead geologist who worked on the project that all of the geological and geophysical work stopped a number of years ago. So I'm glad I found the information when I did, because this scientific data could have been lost forever. My next video on the subject will discuss the geophysical findings of Saxe Horman as there is irrefutable evidence that some structures go down a lot deeper than we see. The georadar geophysical data is far less contentious and I formed a good relationship with a number of scientists who worked on the site in 2012. After my part 2 video, a further video will then take everything into account as I try and date Saxe Horman in a scientific way. A true independent researcher looks at everything objectively, and in this video, I have looked in detail at the geology of Saxe Horman. I carefully considered the claims from 2012, and now I have to say, with further research, I think a man made origin for the blocks of Saxe Horman is in fact next to impossible. The blocks of Saxe Horman are either homogeneous natural micritic limestone, or naturally altered limestone due to contact with a lava extrusion. The rock looks to have been quarried on site, possibly from the top of the hill, which may have been worked, shaped and flattened before the temples and structures were made. If so, the builders didn't drag huge blocks over long distances, and I doubt they set up industrial scale lime making facilities. These people were efficient and intelligent, but I think they did have something to aid their work, and that could well be a very particular type of acid. Natural geological features and also the application of such an acid can explain a lot of anomalies of Saxe Horman, and I'll go through all of this in a future video. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.